Hi everyone, I'm the Plant Propagator and welcome to my channel. Well, today is the first uh, plant biotechnology lecture that I wanted to share with you. And, but before I start into that, and, and just so you know, I'll be making, uh, I'll be doing that on my laptop, which is behind me, and it'll be a series of PowerPoint uh, presentations with me uh, narrating and going through things and everything like that. Um, I'm going to be doing this in a number of different locations. I'm going to start off here. This is the first plant biotechnology lecture today. Uh, it may be the last one, depending on the, the interest and views and a number of other things. But we'll see how it goes. And it's going to be a short lecture. So this is just going to be a, uh, an introduction to give you an overview. Uh, and the lecture, the second lecture after that, we'll, I'll talk about DNA basics. We'll go into uh, plant cloning. Uh, DNA introduction, methods of de various methods of DNA introduction, genome editing, um, you know, the, the concerns about GMOs and all those types of things. Maybe <laughs> if we last long enough. Um, they'll, I'm, I'm going to try to keep them short and fairly simple. Uh, my lectures, when I gave them to my class, were you know, the class length was 50 minutes. So I'll try to keep them down, and I may break some lectures in, in half. But again, depending on the interest, if there really isn't much interest, <laughs> this, this could be the last one. So we'll see how it goes. I'm presenting this uh, to you right now from my office uh, in uh, the Midwest U.S. Inside, because it's the middle of December and it's really cold outside, of course. Uh, and I'll do the, I'll probably in Southwest Florida, I may do it from uh, my office area inside. I may do it from the laboratory. We'll just have to see how that goes and how, see how things progress and even see if I get that far. Um, my office around me, I just have to show you some things around my office. This is, um, this is really filled with things from, um, my career, and there's there are some things that, like I said, I would like to uh, I would like to share with you. Um, I try to keep these things around me to re remind me of the fun time that I've had so far, and that hopefully I'll continue uh, to do this. But I've got um, gifts that people have given to me, uh, students and postdocs uh, throughout my career. I've got some things from my uh, travels. Here is a ticket. You may or may not be able to see it well, but this is a ticket to the Great Pyramids in Cairo, uh, which I went through early on. And Ahmed, my tour guide, if you're watching, how you doing, guy? Um, I have, here is a, uh, here's an elephant uh, that I picked up uh, in, in Thailand. Uh, that was more, that was more recent. That was just a few years ago. Um, here's a, uh, since it is so close to Christmas, here is a snow globe and a, from my son and a paperweight from my daughter dressed up as Santa back when they were pretty small. Um, and I keep these around here. I, I'm sure my son doesn't even remember giving that uh, to me, but it is, uh, these are still things that I keep around me that remind me of, of the fun that I've had uh, so far. Uh, one of the other things I want to show you, so here's my uh, retirement clock right here. And I keep this on my desk, and if you can see, it says zero because I'm already uh, retired. And so uh, I retired from the university where I taught a plant biotechnology course for a graduate level course for about 10 years. I taught an undergraduate uh, issues in biotechnology course for about another another 10 years. I taught uh, actually a laboratory course, graduate level laboratory course in biotechnology. Uh, well, it was one of the first courses that I taught, but lab courses are just tough uh, to teach because they're just so, uh, they're so intense. Um, anyway, um, I also wanted to share with you some things um, as far as why I'm qualified. Uh, you know, it's a good idea to, for the first lecture to give you a little bit of an idea of background and where I'm coming from. And um, in the plant biotechnology area, I, I um, spent most of my career here in, the, in an academic laboratory. 
uh, for 35 years at a, at a major uh, Midwest University laboratory. Uh, before that, I was in industry, so I did a postdoc uh, in industry for about two and a half years, and I learned in, in the biotechnology area, you have to be familiar with some of the things that are going on in industry, which, which I was. Again, I left that a long time ago. Um, but it, it, it helps to have that viewpoint because many of the advances in, in plant biotechnology uh, come from industry. Some do come from academic uh, laboratories as well. Um, I've been in the area for a long time. Um, I am a fellow in the, uh, in the Society for In Vitro Biology, which is not, which I'm very proud of. Uh, I know a lot of the people that did and are still doing plant biotechnology, so I, I was active in the area for most of my career, and I was really in the middle of a lot of the, lot of the technology development. Um, we even generated technology in my laboratory that was used and is in the fields of about, you know, of, of many of the, uh, the, the corn and soybean acreage uh, in the U.S. as well as uh, internationally as well. So I, I've contributed uh, to a lot of things in, in, that, in that way. I know some of the early biotechnologists, and this is, this is, uh, yeah, you can tell, this is a baseball. And so was this signed by a baseball player? Well, I don't know if you could tell the signature on there. It's kind of hard to see. Um, but yes, it was signed. I thought I silenced my clock. Yes, I didn't. Um, it, um, it was signed by a baseball player, and this baseball player um, is, is Norman Borlaug. And he's a Nobel laureate, and I've got an image of him um, giving the baseball back to me. He's uh, no longer with us, but this is the uh, Nor Norman Borlaug is the father of the Green Revolution. So he really was one of the first plant biotechnologists. Um, but he was, he was a wheat breeder, and he developed wheat breeding lines uh, that were uh, essentially shorter, more compact, and they didn't lodge or fall over when the wind blew and when there were heavy storms. Um, and so why, why, why the autograph the baseball? Well, um, when he was growing up, he wanted to be a baseball player. He was a shortstop. I think he might have played at, at Cornell, uh, which is where he went to school. Um, but he, it, it didn't work out. He never became a professional baseball player, but when for, he spent a lot of his career in Mexico and he, he, um, he, he acknowledges himself as one of the main people to bring little league baseball to Mexico. So he really, at, at the core of all of the incredible work that he did in the area of wheat breeding and wheat improvement and, and plant biotechnology, um, you know, and he told me the story. It was fun. I gave him the baseball to sign. He said, you know, and then he told me the story. Um, and, and he's really happy of it, proud of his baseball roots. Uh, one of the other things that I want to show with you, uh, again, to, and again, this is the, the, what I'm, the point that I'm trying to make is that, uh, that I'm sharing information with you and even the material that I'll present to you. Um, I, I know a lot of the people that, that did and are doing this work, and I can tell the stories and the background information on these advances in plant biotechnology. So I have that background, I have that information, and I'm happy to share it with you. Some people don't like when I tell the stories. They want fact, fact, fact. But the stories to me are fun, and I was involved in this, and, I, and I'm happy to share that with you. This if you can see it, is, is a picture of, uh, it, it's a cover of Time Magazine. And the person on the cover of Time Magazine is Ingo Patricus, who is the, uh, the father of Golden Rice. So he was, and I know Norman Borlaug, I, I didn't know him, he, I didn't know him very well at all. Uh, Ingo, I've spent some time with him, I know him. Uh, he spent most of his career, he's, re, he's retired, retired, but still pretty active, uh, and he spent most of his career uh, in, in Switzerland. Uh, but I still know him. It's, the plant biotechnology community, when you look at it, is, is pretty small, and so you get to know a lot of the people that are in this field when you go to these meetings. And so I spent a lot of time uh, over my career going to various meetings all over the world 
and uh, and and I got to know Ingo more when he visited uh, visited me in the U.S. But but also I, I you know we we met and at meetings and we talked um, and and. It, so I know that, and I know it. And he he actually, if this is a cover, and the reason it's it's framed is because um, he autographed it for me at the bottom here and wrote me uh, wrote me a note, which I which I value him and and I really I really like. So what I again what I want to do. So we'll start. I could keep on going on, but I'm not. I'll try to tell you some stories as we uh, move through the material. Again, today what I want to do is just to give you a very short overview of, of biotechnology. I'm going to change the camera. I'm going to go to the PowerPoint and the quality of the audio. We'll have to see how it goes because I'm using a new audio setup on my laptop so that I can use the microphone associated with that machine in order to narrate the, uh, the PowerPoints. Let me switch things around, share my PowerPoint with you, and we'll see how it goes. Okay, and we are back. Uh, so what I want to do is go over, give you a basic PowerPoint introduction to plant biotechnology. And what I want to cover today is, first of all, what is plant biotechnology? Uh, second thing I want to go over is why is plant biotechnology relevant? And then, I'm sorry, we have to go, we have to have some definitions while well, we have, we'll have one for plant biotechnology. But I also want to define transgenes, uh, GMO, and we'll, we'll touch on a little bit of genome editing, but not very much. What I want to do today, again, this is just an introduction. I'm not going to get into too much detail. We'll save that for some of the other uh, classes that I'll present if you think I should move forward. Uh, the final thing that I'll end up talking about is adoption of GMOs in the USA and worldwide. And I should mention that when I go over this, I have some uh, current information, some current data, and then I have some data that's a little, a little old. Plant biotechnology really changes day to day, week to week, year to year, uh, and some of the information is a few years old, and you just need to be aware of that going in. I'll bring that point up again as we go over some of that, some of those slides and some of those old slides. And again, with this material, I try to stay current, but sometimes when you stand away uh, from it for a little while, you can't be as current as you want to be. And then sometimes the information that I'm able to access isn't as current as I'd like to be. But I'll explain it as we move forward. Okay, so the first thing is, what is biotechnology? When you look at the word biotechnology, there's a couple of words within here, and we break that down. Biotechnology includes the, uh, the phrase bio, which stands for biology, and technology, which is application. So when you string, these, string this word together, what biotechnology means is the application of biological sciences. So it's a very broad definition that includes a number of different uh, technologies and approaches. Um, and, and this is how I want to use this. And this is, this is what this phrase means. This is what this word means. And this is how I want to use this term. Um, you can take this a little bit further. And I like this definition that's put out by uh, USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, which defines biotechnology as use of biological processes for the benefit of humans. And what I used to do in my class is tell my students at this point that this is guaranteed going to be the first question on the midterm and final exam. What is biotechnology? And this is what I want them to put is use of biological processes for the benefit of humans, because this is a very good general definition. What biotechnology means to different people is different things. And so um, looking at the second def definition uh, that's put out by Google, the exploitation of biological processes for industrial and other purposes, especially the genetic manipulation of microorganisms for the productions of antibiotics, hormones, etc. So biotechnology, again, initially focused on microorganism, microorganisms and, and a lot of the medicines that are produced 
in today are produced by microorganisms using biotechnology approaches. Um, plant biotechnology is def defined here as the introduction of desirable traits into plants by genetic modification. So this is, again, a little bit more of a specific definition of, of plant biotechnology. You can use the broad definition of application in, in plant biotechnology, application of, of biological sciences uh, for, to plants, but a lot of people really like and use the definition of introduction of desirable traits. Now, this can occur through a number of routes that we'll go into in a little bit. Um, the final thing is uh, manipulation by, by um, Wet Merriam Webster, uh, which is the which are the dictionary people. Manipulation as through genetic engineering of living organisms or their components to produce usually commercial products such as pesticides and crop, new bacterial strains or no novel pharmaceuticals. Also, any applications of biological science used in such manipulation. So. You know, the various definitions of plant biotechnology. Here, a use of biological processes for the benefit of humans is the good, broad definition that I like to use. Why should you be interested in this? Well, biotechnology is all around us. And there are broad, it's a broad definition because there are broad applications. Um, when you look at plant biotechnology, most people refer to just gene introduction or gene manipulation. But reality of this is for this broad definition is that even cloning of plants is part of and part of plant biotechnology and it actually is central to the advances in plant biotechnology and gene introduction and genome editing approaches. So because cloning of plants when you clone a plant from a single cell essentially the core of plant biotechnology is to be able to use that single cell to either manipulate the DNA in that cell or introduce new DNA into that cell. So cloning of plants is really part of it, but it's the core and it's central to all of the advances in plant biotechnology. And cloning of plants, we'll get into that in a little bit more, in a lot more detail actually, uh, because that is where my background lies. Uh, the final thing is why should you be interested in biotechnology? It's so you can hold informed conversations, be able to understand various aspects of GMOs, plant cloning, genome editing, and all of that. So it's good to be aware of what plant biotechnology is. GMOs and plant biotechnology and biotechnology is all around us. And you, it, it just, for me, it it's, I think, useful to be aware of what's around us and be able to hold informed conversations and have informed discussions uh, in the area of plant biotechnology. And, and hopefully you'll be able to do that if, if we make it through all of, the, all of the classes. All right, so now what we need to do is, is go into definitions a little bit more and talk about what are transgenes and GMOs. So these terms are uh, used a lot uh, in the plant biotechnology area. Uh, a transgene refers to, well, again, break this word down. Trans means across. So it's the process of taking genes from one organism and then introducing them into another organism. So it's crossing the genes. Uh, and this is different from standard breeding. Um, and, and actually the course that I taught was breeding and biotechnology where classical breeding was one of the components uh, of the course. But what I'm going to talk about for the modified course that I'm going to be sharing with you is just transgenic approaches. And so this again is taking genes and introducing them into organisms that they no normally those genes wouldn't be associated with. All right, and then GMOs is, stands for genetically modified organism. GMO does not, is not the same as genome edited. These are, there, there, there are some similarities in the processes, 
to produce GMOs compared to genome edited plants, but they're very different. So a genome edited plant is something that has a very targeted mutation that could be generated naturally. It can just take a while, but it's very targeted. It allows you to take, take a gene or a component of a gene and, and modify it very precisely through a mutation type approach. It also allows you to cut out pieces of DNA that can occur doing, during natural mutagenesis. A GMO is, is more, again, talks about the introduction of DNA, permanent introduction of DNA into an organism where, and, and let's look at this first diction, definition from dictionary, an organism, GMO is an organism whose genome, again, that's the, the genetic components, has been altered by the technique of genetic engineering so that its DNA contains one or more genes not normally found there. So <clears throat> from this definition, it's the introduction of a gene that normally wouldn't be found there. So it's not the same as a sexual hybridization. And, and the interesting thing is that how far can you go? So the technology that is being, that is developed, you can make a lot of pretty wide crosses in the orchid area. You can do easily interspecific, <clears throat> easily intergeneric. So you can go pretty broad with the crosses but you can't cross uh, an orchid with a soybean plant or a corn plant or something like that. But through plant biotechnology, you can do that. Or you can take a virus gene and introduce it into one plant or a bacterial gene or any, really any gene. DNA is DNA is DNA. Uh, and you can take that and move it from one organism to the other using transgenic approaches. All right, so here's another definition from Wikipedia defines a GMO as an organism whose genetic material has been altered using genetic engineering techniques. Um, and again, genetic engineering techniques also include genome edited. This, um, you know, this may be a little bit of an older definition. So, but the GMO is typically defined as where a gene has been introduced that just isn't normally found there. You'll take a look at these final two definitions here <clears throat> and GMOs can be defined as organisms, plant, animals, or microorganisms in which the genetic material, DNA, has been altered in a way that does not occur naturally by mating and or natural recombination. Um, and so I, in these last two definitions, I have the word naturally underlined. And, and so the interesting thing is there's when you take a look at these definitions, there are words in there that need to be further defined. So the question is, all right, in these definitions where a trend, where in GMOs can't naturally occur, what does natural mean? Okay, so it's important for us to understand what is natural? What does this mean? And the first definition is from a dictionary, existing in or caused by nature, not made or caused by humankind. And second definition from Webster, again, the dictionary, people existing in nature and not made or caused by people. So there's all these definitions here that natural means not made or not caused or no intervention by people or humankind. And, and you look at this a little further, and I actually had a class where I had multiple lectures where we talked about what does natural mean? And, you know, when you look at this, does this mean that if it's not made or caused by humankind that you and me and humans in general are not natural. So any human intervention makes something unnatural. Are we unnatural? You can really tweak this definition, but it's interesting. And this, this happens over and over again in this, in this area. Um, so what does this mean? You know, not, and, and I think it's, it's clear what the intent is, but then you look at it a little deeper and then it becomes really muddy. All right, so one of the other things that I want to talk to, uh, talk about is this other term, natural foods and all natural foods. So these are terms that are widely used in food labeling and marketing, and they have a variety of definitions, and, and they're mostly vague. So many different plants, many different foods are labeled as natural foods, but the definition is really broad and it's kind of lost its meaning. And you look at it because it's, it's embraced by the consumer, natural is seen as good. But you know, the interesting thing is, okay, does natural mean 
um, you know, not, not, no human intervention because all foods have had human intervention. And, and because of that, this definition is really, really broad and it, it's really lost its meaning. When you look down in this last definition, by the way, this last area, there's a term organic here in quotes. So the term organic, however, has an established legal definition. And organic is really defined, USDA defines uh, what organic means and you know, the plants and the plant products that are certified as organic, there's very strict definitions and very strict regulations on what organic is and what it means. GMOs are not organic. They're mutually exclusive. Um, and so, you know, some of these terms you got to be careful about, but you should be aware of. All right, moving on then. Um, what I want to do is talk about why, you know, why, again, a little bit more information. Why is this interesting? Why should you be aware of this? And, and the use of biotechnology. So biotechnology can be used in basic research. So there's basic applications um, and then there is applied research. And, and again, so the use of, you know, the use of biotechnology to understand gene function is really one of the, one of the really uh, real benefits of using plant biotechnology. So using plant biotechnology, you can increase, decrease, you can knock out genes, and you can generate mutants. So you, it's very simple, very straightforward, and it really is eloquent approach in order to look at gene function by modifying the, the expression of that gene or by eliminating that gene. And you can really see what it does when you do this. You can generate target mutants and you can, you can targeted mutants and you can target multiple genes. So you can see how genes interact. You can do a number of different things. So, so there's a lot of basic research that can be done using biotechnology to understand gene function. If you understand gene function, you, you essentially can make these organisms more efficient. You can, you know, cure diseases. You can do a number of different things. The second, the second thing that I want to talk about is commercial transgenics. So, uh, can you do this? Um, can you do it with uh, all different plants? So which plants? How common is this? Is there money to be made? And the answer to that is yes, absolutely. To make more efficient crops, feed the world and save the planet. Now I got into this area many years ago because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to make plants more efficient for producing uh, you know, the food and feed that they generate. Um, and, and there are also, you know, there's also the beauty of plants that can be modified, uh, the aesthetics of plants and plant growth habit that can be modified using, using plant biotechnology. Most of the products uh, of plant biotechnology are not for aesthetics, but some of them are. And the, but the initial uh, commercial transgenics, it's mostly food and feed crops. So what I want to do is go over, um, there is money to be made. Most of these products, not all, but most of these products are a result of uh, various uh, companies that have used the technology to generate products that has resulted uh, in, um, in a much more efficient crop production system in the U.S. and worldwide, uh, but also has enhanced uh, their profits. And it has really changed, biotechnology has really changed the surface of the planet as far as, as far as plants go. All right, looking at least initially in the U.S. at adoption of genetically engineered crops, this is a graph that shows various um, GMOs and the HT here stands for herbicide tolerance. So this is herbicide tolerant soybeans. This is Roundup Ready soybeans. Um, the other, and there's other, there's herbicide tolerant cotton, which is also Roundup Ready cotton. There's BT cotton shown here. And I should say this is percentage on the left axis here, um, is the, uh, percent of planted acreage in the U S and at the top here is a hundred percent. So you look at these crop plants and they're between 75 and 100 percent in many cases above 90 percent of the crops of these crop plants in the U.S. are GMOs. So it's the clear majority. Uh, started these things were released 
in the mid 90s and the adoption was just incredible uh, till, till there was a peak maybe in around close to a peak uh, pretty much in 20, uh, 2014 of these crops. Um, the, uh, so again, this is um, soybeans, cotton, here's BT cotton and BT corn. And BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. Bacillus thuringiensis, and we'll get into more detail on this, is a bacterium that produces a protein toxin that is active against certain insects. So when certain insects ingest the organism that contains the, uh, the protein toxin, the insect is, uh, it actually can't digest the food. Uh, and it dies. And Bt, it's interesting, Bt is a naturally occurring organism and it is used by the organic food industry. Uh, in the plant biotechnology area, the Bt gene from Bacillus thuringiensis was modified and then introduced into cotton and corn, and a number of different plants. Um, and, but the real benefit in the, uh, it came from um, cotton and corn where the insects that damaged these plants um, were, real, were susceptible to the Bt toxin that was introduced. All right, but the, what I wanted to po the point that I wanted to make is that there was very rapid adoption of these GMOs in the early days till, till it got to the point that the majority of acreage, at least in the U.S., was um, GM, certainly for the case of uh, soybean, cotton, uh, and corn. One of the other things, I, so, so you can point out here, is that you've got H herbicide-tolerant cotton, Bt cotton, and then you've got Bt corn and herbicide-tolerant corn. So these genes now are being stacked and more on that a little bit more but you can put multiple genes in these plants in order to have a really um, really tremendous effects on the growth and productivity of these plants and lessening or modifying the application of the various pesticides all right so looking at some of the other products of plant biotechnology again on the left axis this is percent u.s acreage this is from a i should say that the previous slide let me go back to it this is pretty current this goes till 2022 so this year um and we haven't planted the 2023 crowd well, we're not in 2023 yet so this is really current and things have stayed pretty similar for the past um you know almost 10 years um, so this is current. A lot of the data that I have now is, is a little bit older. So this is from 2014. And, but this shows some of the different products of plant biotechnology. And on the left axis, percentage of U.S. acreage. So cotton, again, 96%. Here's sugar beet that I didn't talk about. And this is herbicide-tolerant sugar beet. Again, in the U.S., sugar beet is responsible for the majority of sugar production. So um, sugar beet is herbicide tolerant and, and it really has been beneficial for the sugar, sugar beet industry uh, to have this. Um, here is herbicide tolerant soybeans right here. Here is corn that has its insect resistance, so that's BT herbicide tolerance, and DT stands for drought tolerance. So as we move on, a number of different traits have been in, introduced, certainly in the corn. But look at these, 90, 90 to 96% of the acreage in the U.S. has been planted with plant biotech or GMO crops. All right, some of the other things that I'll, I want to point out that are maybe a little less that you may not be aware of, but here's papaya, and this is virus-resistant papaya. This is an interesting story. In Hawaii, there was a virus that almost led to the complete destruction of the of papaya production in, in Hawaii. And virus resistance, this is essentially, uh, it, it's a type of vaccine type approach where part of the virus genome was introduced into papaya and it made it, it's a classical approach in plant biotechnology and it made virus resist. So this is a papaya ring spot virus. It made virus resistant uh, papaya. And it was initially adopted, and then there were concerns in Hawaii about, um, about GMOs, and it's, it's just back and forth and back and forth. But this really saved the papaya 
uh, industry, papaya, papaya production industry in Hawaii. Uh, here's alfalfa, herbicide tolerant alfalfa, and this is summer squash. It says um, herbicide tolerant, but this is virus resistant summer squash. Only a small 12%, only a small uh, percentage of this in the U.S. And, and again, just remember this, is, this data is uh, a little bit older. Um, looking globally, that's been U.S. looking globally. I just have a couple of slides on global adoption of GMOs. So this goes, again, it's a little outdated, 1996 to 2016. And this is the, uh, the number of hectares or acres on this axis of um, soybean, corn, uh, cotton, and canola. Um, and even though it's not hugely high, and in corn especially, corn is produced a lot internationally, so there's only a small, not a huge percentage of acreage or of hectares worldwide. Uh, well, it's, it is a significant amount, but it's not compared to the U.S. It's not, it's not 90, 95, 96 percent um, globally. It's, it's, I think it might be like, um, you know, about 30 percent globally. Um, but soybean actually is, um, you know, soybean acreage is pretty high globally. Most of the most soybean uh, is made in the U.S., Argentina, and Brazil, and all of those countries have adopted uh, GMO soybean. Uh, cotton again a little lower, and uh, canola a little lower. But what I want you to take a look at is the trend, and the trend is increasing. Until you may see a, there may be a peak here, it may be leveling off here uh, with soybean, but globally there is, there continues to be increases in utilization of products of plant biotechnology. The last slide here, I want to, this is one point that I want to make, is that this shows um, on this axis number of acres. Again, this is global area of biotech crops. Again, a little old, 1996 to 2016, and you can see the increase. But what I want you to see here is that there tends, there is a, a peak or maybe a downtrend, and this green line is herbicide tolerance. And so this is peaking or declining. Um, what I also want you to see is that, you know, the insect resistance, it's peaked pretty much here. But the, the point that I want you to really focus on is the, um, the kind of yellowish brownish line uh, in the middle where it just continues to increase, which is stack traits. And this is the trend is not to introduce one gene, either herbicide tolerance or insect resistance, but the trend is to include large, uh, more than one gene. So stack traits, two to more, to more, to up to, I've seen reports, 20 or 30 different genes that are introduced that collectively have a tremendous beneficial effect on plant productivity. So this is the, this is the trend, and this is really seen in the U.S., but also um, globally. So that's all I have for today um, in the, just a, is to give you a very basic introduction to plant biotechnology and some of the products and, and why you should um, be interested in plant biotechnology um, and what's out there and again, the trends in the U.S. and globally. Uh, what I want to talk with you next time is about DNA basics. And, and again, what I think you should do is come into these, um, you know, come into these classes and just kind of, you know, relax with a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and just um, try to grasp the basics. I'm going to try to try to share things with you at a very basic level, but uh, we have to get in deep in order to understand um, plant biotechnology, the different approaches and the different technologies that are out there that contribute, that have contributed to this uh, area. So what I want to talk to you next time is about DNA basics. I'll go over um, very basic DNA function, um, how DNA is manipulated in the laboratory, how it is uh, cloned, and I'm going to also want to go into some very basic, um, give you a basic understanding of PCR because it, it is um, a very basic tool that's used across a number of different discipline areas, and it has really enhanced the ability to clone and manipulate um, DNA.
All right, so that's all I have for today. If you have suggestions for topics that you want to hear about, or if you want to comment that this this course material is just terrible, um, uh, or but constructive criticism, what you would like to see, um, more detail, less detail, want me to talk faster, want me to talk slower, anything, any kind of comments you want to include, I'm happy to uh, listen to that. So um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to keep on seeing these, uh, just let me know and I'll put a few more lectures. I'll, I'll put the one more lecture together on DNA uh, basics. Uh, but after that, it's, it's up to you guys to let me know if you want to keep on hearing about this stuff. All right. That's all I have today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you want to see more and happy propagating.